Josh sits in silence. Sue can tell he's in deep thought. She doesn't attempt to bother him. Then he mutters, go inside and try to get some rest. Let me worry about this. After all, I'm the one who got us into this whole mess. Stupid fool that I am. He steps out of the truck and begins pacing the floor. She turns the light on before entering the kitchen through the door leading from the garage. I'll be in shortly. If the phone rings, don't answer it. I don't want anyone to know we're here yet. Let them think we're at the movies or something. He explains. Then he makes a suggestion, why don't you turn on the tube and see if the local news has any revelations about Mr. Jack. Sue indulges the idea, shutting the door behind her. Josh is still hoofing the floor back and forth. He plods toward the stagnant mass lying in the back of the truck and hoists the tarp up for a peek. The body is motionless. Still lying in the same position they had placed him. Jack is considerably more rigid now. He was not the fleshy pink Josh remembers him being. He is more of a purple color. His eyes, still fixed. Josh has to turn from Jack's concentrated expression. It's eerie and permanent. Chills run up and down his spine as he covers the body. He has to do something with the corpse before it starts pushing up daisies from beneath the tarp. Man, now I can say you're starting to smell a bit strange, Josh asserts as he pinches his nostrils closed. He leans against the side of the truck as he scrutinizes the garage. He looks up at the rafters. He gazes at an old trunk sitting off in the corner. His eyes shift to the chemicals sitting on a dusty shelf. He walks over and starts to read the labels and examines bottles and containers. Bleach, turpentine, bug spray, liquid drain gel, gasoline, antifreeze, propane, kerosene, charcoal fluid. He's frustrated. He doesn't have chemicals forcible enough to cause the body to just melt away. He contemplates using acid. He extracts horror flick scenes from his mind where acid was used to dissolve the cadavers. Then his mind slips deeper. He paints a mental picture of serial killer John Hay, the acid bath murderer. How he was caught and executed. He remembers the story well. It was a television special called, Gruesome Chambers of Horror, it was a band of photographers and journalists who traveled around the world in search of freak show type wax museums. They highlighted wax figures of infamous killers and told their stories. He figures sulfuric acid will do the trick. Turning the body to sludge. That would be the ideal way to get rid of Jack, no doubt. He stands there for a while contemplating his options. His ill-boding considerations are bulldozing any communal rationale. He's struggling with making an ethical decision at this point, he just can't bring himself to do it. He feels like a guilty man, a killer. All of the staunch teachings he had received as a boy have succumbed to the defense of self-preservation. He feels a transformation taking place internally. A mutation of sorts percolating within his soul. He can slow it down as everything that was once right is now wrong. There's some commotion in the garage as Josh searches for a way to read Jack from their lives, once and for all. He pulls out some power tools. A circular saw, a hacksaw, an extension cord, a roll of plastic garbage bags, a shovel, some duct tape, and a crowbar. The garage is in shambles as he steps over smashed boxes and objects strewn about. Then, the sound of the tailgate dropping resonates the house. Sue is watching the news as Josh staggers into the kitchen grappling the tools. Hurry, they're talking about Jack, as she reaches for the remote to turn the volume up. What are they saying, Josh asks in a state of paranoia, releasing the tools in a single motion. He dashes for the sofa and listens intently. His eyes glued to the screen. I don't know. Sue responds as she turns the volume up another notch or two. 
The reporter is broadcasting live from the Rangers Post. This is Sylvia Collins, reporting live for KKTV Channel 5 at Ranger Station 15, here in the Vista Mountains of Colorado. Tonight, police are scouring the area for Jack Greensburg. Mr. Greensburg is the owner of Jack's Place, the well-known fast food burger chain. He has been missing for 96 hours now and family and friends are worried. A car registered to Jack Greensburg was located earlier today. Authorities aren't saying anything more at this point, pending further investigation. Mr. Greensburg has not been found. I repeat, Jack Greensburg is still missing. If you have any information regarding his whereabouts, please contact your local police department. A picture of Jack is posted on the screen with a phone number. This is Sylvia Collins KKTV Channel 5 from the Vista Mountain Ranger Station 13. Back to the studio. Sue gazes over at Josh. Would you relax? You sound like you're going to have an attack. You need to slow down, she says as she turns the TV down. Josh is breathing heavy and starts to cough a little. Where's your inhaler? Maybe you need to do a treatment. Your asthma sounds horrible, she reaches for his puffer and hands it to him. He takes two puffs and coughs some more. His eyes are red and he's pasty looking. Sweat is trickling down his forehead. I'll be okay. I'm just a little shaken at the moment, he renders. Sue stands to her feet and walks over to the window. She peeks out from the blinds. It's getting late. What are we going to do about this situation, Josh? She asks as she begins to pace the floor. Josh jumps to his feet and heads for the kitchen. I have an idea, he states as he pulls a throw carpet up and tosses it aside. A gorgeous hardwood floor is exposed. Oh, absolutely no way, Josh. You're not thinking what I think you're thinking, are you? Sue asks. Got a better idea? Besides, no one will ever suspect dear old Jack to be down there. It's perfect, he answers. I'm not so sure it's foolproof. Have you given any consideration to what you're actually planning to do here? This was your mother's home, Josh. I mean, don't you feel a bit uneasy about this? She steps over tools and makes her way to the sink for a glass of water. Her hands shaking as she lifts the glass to drink. We have worked so hard for everything we have. All of the college, the odd jobs and constant struggles, our finances, everything. We could lose it all if we get caught, she adds. Josh stays quiet as he reaches for the extension cord, plugging it into an outlet near the coffee pot. Move out of the way, Sue. If you're not going to help me, just step back, he sounds agitated with her whining. His face, showing signs of irritability. His mind, working overtime. His body, dog-tired. The sound of the circular saw gyrates against the floor. Sawdust kicks up and scatters through the air. There's no turning back now. It's do or die, so to speak, Josh says as he applies pressure to the saw for deeper cuts. Sue stands back feeling helpless. She wants to run, but where? She scampers back to the window and peeks out again, saying, it's raining. That should help mask the noise, I suppose. Yeah, let's just hope it's raining heavy up at the campsite too. That'll cover the tire tracks, Josh says as he knocks on the floorboards. Well, from the looks of all the activity at the ranger station. She begins to talk as Josh interrupts, yeah, there's no way they'll pick up on the tire marks. He continues vibrating the floor with the saw. Then the clanking sound of tools being shifted about takes precedence. Josh secures the crowbar in his hands as he pries it under the cut wood and applies tension. His body flies backwards and he lands against the cupboards. The sliced boards pop out and a small crawl space is revealed. The area sits beneath the kitchen. 
It's dark and cold. Spiders run seeking refuge and webs dangle about. Get me a flashlight, sweetheart, he requests as he dunks his head in to snoop around. Be careful, Josh. Watch for black widows. I don't want you getting bit, she warns. Black widows? I'm more worried about nails and exposed wires, he exclaims as he takes hold of the flashlight and moves in. Okay, this looks like it'll do the job. I think I can move around enough down here to dig. The challenge is digging deep enough without hitting any electrical or water. Slide the shovel down, would ya, he utters as he tries to adjust his body within the constricted area. Okay, but what are you going to do with the excess dirt? She questions, somewhat worried that he'll entomb himself. I'll spread it around. There are some niches down here. I'll fill them in, he answers as he drags the shovel in. Then all goes quiet. The only sound is the scraping metal of the shovel being jerked across the dirt. Josh is focused straight ahead as he begins to peck at the dirt like a hen. Soon, the pecks become more of a rhythmic prime. Scoop after scoop he ushers through the moist earth. As the hole becomes larger, he strews clods of soil around. Sue clings to the opening, her eyes exploring the crawl space, her body trembling in fright. She feels like she's going to have an anxiety attack. How much longer, Josh, she asks as she feels her body jump uncontrollably. Spasms through her legs make it hard for her to stay in one place. It's going to take a while. I just don't have the room I need, he retorts as he spits dirt from his mouth. Go check on Jack, he orders like the captain below deck. Check on Jack, she seems a bit baffled by the command. He's dead, Josh. It's not like he's gonna get up and walk away from this, Sue is huffing at the thought. Just go check on Jack, would ya, he howls from the pit. Okay, okay. Keep your shirt on, will ya? I'll go check on Jack, she's very upset now. As she walks toward the garage door, she looks back at the kitchen floor shaking her head in rage. Oh, Jack, where art thou? She wails sarcastically. Josh is listening to her mumble something above. He can't really make it out. He hears, lo and behold, another bright. He is stressed and wants to respond, but bumps his head on a nail instead. Ouch. He's bleeding a little. But the incident stops him from an argument with Sue. Who the hell left you in charge anyway, she mutters as she creeps over to the truck. Inch by inch, she slowly treads closer to the body swathed in the tarp. Who am I, the damn gopher? Go for this and go for that. This can't be real, no way. Pinch yourself, Sue. Strike that. Just lift the darn cover. The garage is somewhat muggy now. The rainfall mixed with the heat from the truck has the windows fogged up. She reaches out to grab hold of the tarp and recoils. She tries again, slowly extending her hand out. She touches the overlay. Closing her eyes and holding her breath, she feels for Jack beneath. He's still there. His body hardened and cold now. She flinches and runs back to the kitchen. He's still there, Josh, she's choking on her saliva as she confirms Jack's body remains in the truck. Why would you have me do such a thing, anyway, she's a bit nibby. I don't really know, to tell you the truth. I just had a vibe, Josh snorts as if he's just recognized a hidden gift of clairvoyance. A vibe, meaning, Sue stakes her claim for an explanation. As Josh flings dirt around within the grotto, he attempts to share his vision. Oh, not sure really. I had a revelation of sorts, I guess you can say. I thought I saw Jack walk through the kitchen door. Never mind. It's just my head playing tricks on me. Sue almost jumps out of her skin. Stop that, Josh. 
I mean it. You're really freaking me out. It's bad enough Jack is in our home. I don't want to hear your inventive ghost stories at the moment. This isn't the time or the place she is obviously upset as her pace picks up tempo. I'm about 2 feet deep and 30 inches wide. Maybe a little short lengthwise, but we'll just have to squeeze him in. Break the legs, if it comes down to it, he sounds like a lunatic as he speaks. Josh, you're really starting to worry me. I don't like this, she states as she senses a change in his voice. He sounds like a mad scientist on a mission. She pictures him dressed in a white smock, tinkering with weird science probes in the privacy of a poorly lit laboratory funded by Hitler. She thinks back to the horrific misuse of Hitler's power and chills run down her spine. Where was the line between morality and evil, she wondered. Now, they were snag in a situation that would be long term. The thought of the truth ever escaping would be staggering for them. It would have extreme consequences. She breaks into her thoughts, complaining about the time. It's already 12 o'clock midnight. From the looks of it, it's going to be early morning before we can get Jack into the hole, she begins sweeping the floor as she talks. Trying to maintain her composer and manage the mess before trailing it further into the house. The dirt is causing some dust to rise up through the opening and Sue is forced to open a window. I don't know, Josh. Call me paranoid, but this sort of thing can leave behind all kinds of evidence. We have sawdust, dirt particles all over the end. God, should I go on, she's apparently very tired. So, have me committed, he squeals from below. The dirt still being shoveled. You know, that's not such a bad idea, Sue returns a comment, being very serious at this point. I think we're about there, Sue. I just have to crawl out of this funky catacomb. I never claimed to be a grave digger, so it'll have to do. He hands her the shovel and flashlight, poking his head up. He's completely covered in dirt. He looks like a miner emerging from a mine shaft after a long shift. His head is bleeding from the puncture wound he suffered by the nail. The blood is trickling down his face in slow motion and drying like hot sticky candy. He pulls himself up and out. His boots are muddy and his hands, blistered. He reaches into his dirty pants pocket and pulls out his inhaler. He exhales a labored breath and sucks in the albuterol. Coughing and practically choking, he repeats the motion. Are you okay? Sue expresses concern. Josh responds and then changes the subject a bit, sure, just a little tired. That was a job. I don't think I have worked that hard since I helped dig up that sewer line back in the early 90s. Remember that, babe? Man, now that was real work. To think we did it all by hand, back then. I say, that kind of labor is for the ancient Egyptians. There's no way I could work alongside of them erecting the pyramids. How did they do it, anyway? It remains a mystery to me. I still think they must have had some help from little green men. Speaking of green men, we had better get Jack buried soon. Ha ha, Josh. Great transition, but seriously not funny at all, Sue states. Josh marches toward the garage like an infantry soldier with a calling. He enters the room and glides down the short staircase. Across the pavement he stomps with soily shoes and his dungy painted face. Jack lies hushful and unaware of his final resting place. There won't be a headstone to mark his burial spot. No eulogy filled with loving memories of his life. Nothing but hard cold dirt. There will be no sun beaming down upon his interment. No gentle touch upon the ground where flowers usually lie. He'll rest alone, all by himself. A peace perhaps never to granted to a man that had devoted his life to his family and friends. Sue watches from the doorway as Josh steps up onto the tailgate. 
Taking hold of the tarp he pulls gently, being careful not to spill the body into the open. Jack is inelastic and is easily manipulated. His body follows the direction of Josh's tugs. Soon the breathless mass is at the edge of the gate. The legs stiffly extended in full view. The arms pasted against its sides. The expression upon the face locked in a time past. Josh straightens the tarp and repositions the body. He performs a tuck and roll with the body, covering it completely from sight. Then he slips a large trash bag over the upper body, from the head to the waist. The second bag is leathered from the feet to the midsection. He fastens the complete body bag at the center with duct tape. Then he proceeds to tape up various sections from the feet up to the head in a tightening fashion. Well Jack, looks like you're all suited up and ready for your next engagement. Come on buddy, I'm sorry it had to be this way. But it is you or us at this point, Josh begins to slide the body off of the tailgate feet first. As stiff as a board, Jack's bulk skids down the back end of the truck. Josh firmly wraps his arms around the corpse and holds it in an upright position for a moment. Wow, he's like six feet tall, I sure hope he fits, he says as he pictures the hole he has dug in his mind. Then he calls Sue over. Get hold of him, please. Make sure he doesn't fall over. Sue's horrified. She doesn't want to get close to the inner jack. But she moves in upon instruction. Foot slugging across the floor with the dead man wrapped in his arms, Josh strains toward the door. Jack's feet thudding upon the stairs as Josh pulls him up. Exhausted and near suffocation, he allows the carcass to plummet to the kitchen floor. Sue is trying to clear a walkway from the debris when Josh falls to the floor. He's pushing with everything in him to make it to the aperture in the floor with Jack. Dragging himself and the body he slides into the crawl space. There's a crashing sound as Josh howls. I think I just lost a lung. Son of a stitch just landed on my chest. I'm so sorry sweetheart. Why don't you come up here for a while? Take a break. Sue insists. There's some silence and soon Josh peeks out from the laps in the floor. Did you hear that? he asks. Hear what? she questions as she looks around the kitchen. Sounds like someone's knocking at the front door. Listen. He hints in a whisper with his index finger across his lips. They both stay very still. I don't hear anything, she says as she walks closer to the living room. Standing in the doorway, Sue pauses. Josh, I can't hear anyone at the door. Are you sure it's not your imagination? Oh, wait, someone's knocking. What should I do? Her heart pounding. Thank you for listening. Please join us next time for a continuation of the hidden crawl space.